Welcome to ESGX Live with me, Nigel, like usually in New York, but today coming to you from Vermont and my co-host Paul Herman in San Francisco and to our community for education and information that we hope inspires collaboration and action on all things to do with sustainability. Today we have our monthly green jobs report and then a deep dive into the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Just first as a little bit of context, I remember as a kid when learning at school from a young age that there was 0.03% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I was born at 322 parts per million and just assumed this was a constant. Of course, today, that number has increased by about 30%. The world's population has more than doubled in that time from three and a half billion people to roughly eight billion people today. Arctic ice volumes have almost halved. And going back further in time, there was a scientist by the name of Fourier, who's, some of whose work I studied at university, who had already understood that the concentration of gases in the atmosphere could affect the world's planet and wrote a paper on this in 1837, a shockingly long time ago. Again, roughly when I was born in the very early 1970s, the Club of Rome commissioned work on the effects or the long run outlook for the planet. And here we are 50 years later, very much as that limits to growth book and the modeling predicted where the proverbial has started to hit the fan in a serious way. There is positive news today and a huge amount of changes to, or development has happened in recent times. We have many countries with 2050 targets as one of those graphics in, in that little video showed. We have the IEA report with a pathway to net zero laid out over the next several decades and particularly with action required during the next 10 years. We have the UN World Heritage Committee putting uh, a very severe health warning now on the Great Barrier Reef as being threatened, much to the outrage of the Australian government, although this has been in train for years. And today we have the IKEA Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation committing a billion dollars of their own capital, hopefully to bring another $9 billion to support increased efforts on a shift to renewables in the developed world. All of this is kind of good news and nice, but the threats to some countries are much more severe than that and existential. And this is what we will come back to in learning about the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So that is, with that as the backdrop, I will pass from the East Coast to the West Coast and hand to Paul Herman and Amir Kalegi to take us into the Green Jobs Report. Over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Hope you get a chance to see the lakes of Vermont and of course have some cheddar cheese, maybe even say hi to uh, Bernie there. Um, with me uh, in a similar forest is Amir Kalegi, uh, so PhD candidate at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and part of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. So we're going to do a short 10-minute roundup of green jobs with a focus on oil, gas, coal, and energy. Um, and then we'll lead into um, Mark Campanale and Nicholas Hallstrom to tell us about the fossil free, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and the spirit of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty uh, because we face an existential crisis from fossil fuels. And also joining us today are Danielle Fugue, is Danielle Fergari of uh, As You Sow, a nonprofit and shareholder advocate uh, based uh, uh, in Oakland, California, working nationally. And uh, she's gonna tell us about the campaigns, initiatives and action that each of us uh, can take and can support um, that they lead. So Amir, what's the latest? Tell us about green jobs because you have some uh, new research to share. Perfect, thank you, Paul. So first off, uh, thank you for those of you who are joining us for our monthly green jobs report, which provides data-driven insights on the direction, momentum, and changes towards a greener, more sustainable economy. These insights are made possible through HIP Investor and their human impact and profit ratings, which analyze companies based on pillars of health, wealth, earth, equality, trust, products and services, and management practices of companies. Currently, there's over 2,000 HIP rated US companies 
And for our analysis, these companies are cross-mapped to U.S. industries that are provide that information is provided by the current employment statistics survey. And specifically, we look at data on employment and wages for each of these industries. Once cross-mapped, we're able to find a weighted industry HIP rating. And these HIP ratings fall under three buckets, green, slightly extractive, and extractive. Based on all the pillars, uh, our highest current uh, rated industry is rated at a, a ceiling of 75. Therefore, uh, the green industries are receive a industry HIP rating of 75 to 50. Slightly extractive have a HIP rating of 50 to 25, and extractive industries have a HIP rating between uh, 25 and zero. So the first insight uh, that we see is that jobs in greener industries have been the most resilient to the COVID-19 crisis. What we're looking at here is a graph of the cumulative percent change in employment since February 2020. And we can see here uh, from March 20 to April 20, uh, the initial lockdown caused an employment loss of 20 million jobs over the month. But with green industries, they were the most resilient and had a proportional job loss of 7.22%, whereas extractive industries had the highest proportional job loss of a reduction of around 19%. And even to current, uh, with the most current data from April uh, 2021, extractive industries still have the highest proportional job loss, whereas uh, greener industries have consistently been the most resilient even to present day. So some quick facts on the total private employment of the economy. Um, for April 2021, there has been there is an employment level of uh, 122.7 million, and it that is still seven million jobs below the February 2020 level of employment. Um, leisure and hospitality, the leisure and hospitality industry, similar to March, has been uh, driving the uh, employment change. So we are kind of seeing a higher percent change in low rated hip industries, but this is driven by uh, extractive travel industries such as gambling and their employment returning. So for a quick snapshot on the leaders and laggers of industry uh, gainers and losers, uh, we're seeing uh, as stated before, leisure and hospitality uh, industry sectors leading the uh, job gain over the months of March and April. Um, the industries of restaurants, amusement services, and the travel accommodations were seen as the top industry gainers, whereas the top industry losers were uh, employment services, grocery stores, and transportation equipment. Um, and yeah, so looking at the, the columns, we can see the absolute employment change from March 20, uh, 2021 and uh, April 2021, along with the percent change in total numbers of jobs within each industry. Um, if we look at the rightmost column, we can see the associated human impact plus profit rating for each of those industries as well. A second very significant insight is that green jobs pay significantly more as compared to the other buckets, as can be seen by the graph displayed here, which is showing the average hourly earnings uh, for the months of March and April. Um, along with paying more, uh, green industries had the highest marginal increase from March to April with an increase of 62 cents uh, for the average hourly earnings. Over the same time period, uh, slightly extractive industries increased by 26 cents per hour, while extremely extractive industries increased by 16 cents per hour. In terms of the story of resiliency, uh, we looked at HIP ratings and uh, industry 
hip ratings and uh, but divvy them out by high contact and low contact industry sectors. Um, high contact industry sectors represent industries that have jobs that were not able to socially distance, while low contact industry sectors represent uh, jobs that were able to socially distance. And our analysis is a mimicking the St. Louis Fed's analysis on the uh, deviation between high contact and low contact industry sectors. So looking at this graph here, uh, this is a comparison of uh, that shows the difference between the February 2020 level and April 2021 level of in, uh, jobs in high contact and low contact industry sectors. For high contact industry sectors, uh, there is still a 4.2 million reduction as compared to April 2020. And then for low contact industry sectors, there is a one point. Uh, 9 million reduction uh, as compared to February 2020. But um, we can see here that as industries were higher hip rated, they were more resilient, even in the high contact industry sectors. Um, looking at the graph here, you can see a difference of 2% in terms of the differences between uh, industries that were rated below 30 and industries that were rate, rated above 30. Um, and the same story is said for low contact industry sectors where um, the industry sectors that rated above 30 almost had, or they did have uh, uh, a over half of uh, uh, performing better than uh, the below 30 hip rated industries. So again, the key takeaway here is that even in high contact industry sectors of the economy, greener jobs uh, remained more resilient to job loss when compared to extractive jobs. So as, Ma as Paul uh, mentioned before, our focus uh, of this month's green jobs report is the oil, uh, gas, and coal energy sectors and uh, moving towards a fossil free portfolios along with just greening the economy overall. So looking here, uh, this graph is showing the changes cumulatively from February 2020 for um, each of these industries. And most notably, the uh, is the decline in support activities for oil, gas and mining. So these support activities for oil, gas, and mining represent the construction of infrastructure for oil and gas and mining industries, along with the maintenance. Um, and they represent around 50% of the employment for the entire oil, gas, and mining uh, industry sector as a whole. And we can see here that the oil, gas, uh, coal mining and petroleum stayed relatively stable, or the, it did stay stable since uh, February 20, uh, the February, since February 20, but this is due obviously to the uh, demand and need for, for energy um, within the United States, but the support activities uh, had a very significant decline and continued to decline um, throughout the entire year and over a year, which it deviates from the total private uh, the levels of total private uh, economy employment, which is seen here by the blue trend line. Um, and this being said, this, there's also a correlation with the capital expenditures of um, oil, gas, and mining companies overall, right? Which is can be seen by this next slide. Oh, not by this next slide here, it is coming up. But before that, right, uh, we're looking at the extractive support occupations uh, employment trend over the past decade. Um, we can see here that the peak employment was during 2014 with 433,000 in employment, but took a very steep decline um, over the years um, uh, to 2016. Once the Trump administration uh, was you know settled into office. There was um, initiative to bring back coal mining and oil and gas extraction employment, um, but as they shifted out of office, and you can see the um, steep decline and the continued steep decline um, following the trend of the past decade. 
And again, here we can see um, the combined North American capital expenditures for all publicly listed oil, gas, and mining companies from 1996 to 2020. And if we're looking at the right most uh, data points on this graph, we can see that the sum of 2015 uh, to the sum of 2020, there is a steep decline in capital expenditures. And before going on, I believe Paul wants to. Uh... Yeah, and so it, uh, when we're going to, uh, when we get to talk about the non-proliferation treaty in just a few moments, Amir, this is $125 billion of capital expenditure focused on fossil fuels. It was over 200 five years ago. This is only the North American number. The global number is almost as high as half a trillion dollars. That's capital that's currently committed to these oil crude production, refining, equipment, uh, the integrated oil and gas companies. The coal line actually is tiny. So coals, that's already, that is not a big capex in North America. It is in, in Asia. So this money's got to get reshifted, this hundred billion plus dollars. So we'll come back to that, but I just wanted to reiterate the order of magnitude of these capital commitments. And um, one of the charts that we have in detail that we're not going to show is like Exxon. Exxon is borrowing money to pay its dividends. They're borrowing in debt to pay its dividend while they're laying off workers um, and having to adapt their business. Um, so um, I'll let you finish uh, in a couple of minutes, Amir, so we can get to a deeper dive on non-proliferation treaty. Perfect. And expanding the point on uh, workers being laid off, we saw the steep decline in these support activities that for uh, extractive industries that deal with the construction of infrastructure for oil, gas, and mining. And as we're greening the economy, there's extreme growth capacity for uh, the infrastructure that is needed for greening the uh, uh, economy. Um, we can see here from the uh, Solar Foundation research, uh, specifically from the Solar Energy Industries Association, um, estimates on the uh, job creation for just the solar industry specifically. Um, we can see here with the current policy that there could be an addition of uh, more than 400,000 workers by 2030. And if we were to shift policy for reaching 100% clean electricity by 2035, we could add uh, more than 900,000 solar workers. Continuing to this graph is showing the employment breakdown by sector in the solar industry. And we can see that there is a very large proportion that is for the um, advancement of infrastructure and the installation and developing of um, the uh, solar industry, need, the need of equipment, uh, installing the solar uh, panels and um, systems that are needed to create this clean energy. And that being said, the productivity and interest in uh, uh, solar energy has been on a steep increase since uh, for the past decade. And we're seeing here that despite job losses due to COVID, um, 2020 was the uh, most productive uh, had the most productive labor for the uh, solar industry. And the blue bar graphs are showing energy output versus uh, in megawattage. And we can see here from um, 2020, there's a very significant increase as compared to 2019, despite the loss in jobs. Amir, let's just end here. Okay. And wrap up. So in general, Traditional energy jobs have been stable even during COVID, but support jobs have been greatly reduced. The volume of capital expenditure that has to go away if fossil fuels have to transform is immense. And at the same time, there's a need for capital, which is already taking place with solar, wind, and renewables. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Super. All right, well, let's bring on uh, Mark and Nicholas to say how we can continue to advance this transition. Amir, great job again on the green, monthly green jobs report. Thank you. And so um, Mark and Nicholas, you have a very intriguing idea of adapting what most people associate with nuclear weapons, a non-proliferation treaty, 
with fossil fuels. So how did this come about? That sounds very creative. Go on, Nicholas. All right, uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes, yes. We Great. Can hear you hear you. Excellent, thanks so much for, for that uh, introduction and uh, uh, for um, having us here. Yeah, this is really exciting. I'm not sure how many of you have come across this idea of a uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, it's an idea that has taken um, an incredible kind of momentum over the last one and a half years. Um, and, and, and I think now it's, it's at the sort of real break point. Um, there's been a lot of attention lately um, um, that uh, is, is reaching through a lot of media. Um, that was a, um, a, 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 a very extraordinary letter sent uh, to all the heads of state around the Biden summit signed by 101 Nobel laureates uh, basically promoting this idea. And, and, and there's a lot of headlines and, and even many cities around the world who've, who've lined up to, to support this along with lots of organizations, hundreds of organizations and, and many other entities. So uh, this, this uh, idea of a, a, a sort of equivalent to the nuclear uh, disarmament treaty that came about, uh, recognizing that uh, the threat of nuclear war, of course, is existential and it needs a concerted effort to really scale down and have an ordered kind of face out of this um, and the analogy is pretty striking and it's, it's just incredible to see being part of this uh, treaty initiative, how this narrative is, is just phenomenally uh, powerful and, and effective. People get it right away. They get excited about the sort of grandness of the scheme. Uh, it covers all the components uh, really of the challenge we're up against when it comes to climate change. And, and, and it also has a concreteness to it that I think really is, is appealing. So in short, um, what this treaty is, 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 is trying to do, and it's very, very similar to the non-proliferation treaty, which had three components. It had a recognition that to begin with, let's not further damage, let's have a non-proliferation, non-expansion. So uh, of course, for fossil fuels, that means no more exploration, no more expansion of any kind of fossil fuel uh, um, um, uh, production. Um, and secondly, recognizing that the stockpiles are too high. Um, the UN Environment Program with Stockholm Environment Institute launched a report uh, the last few year, two years, uh, the Production Gap Report, which clearly spells out the, 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 what we're up against. Uh, the fossil fuel industry is planning to, to produce and, 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 and burn 120% more uh, fossil fuels than a one and a half degree target can, can cope with. It's suicidal. So uh, not just do we not, can we not expand, but we have to, of course, disarm um, very, very quickly. And this treaty is, is recognizing that, but also adding a lot of quality to that in terms of recognizing that not all countries and all companies are sort of positioned equally. There needs to be some kind of sense of equity. We need to understand the con context, the economic diversification needs, and of course, um, the justness and the equity components, uh, not least to fossil fuel workers, as, as was just, uh, I think, barely, partly touched on right now uh, in the previous presentation too. Uh, there's scope for new jobs, but there's also a whole lot of jobs that will, will have to be, be changed. And that is coming into the third pillar, uh, which on the disarmament treaty was called peaceful transition. So the idea was, let's not have nuclear weapons, but rather use this power, nuclear power in that case, for something good. And the equivalent here is not to promote nuclear power, but to say, let's then see this as a also platform for transforming from the fossil fuel era to a renewables era. So the transition to 100% renewable energy societies as fast as absolutely possible, recognizing again, equity, the need for economic diversification, and of course, doing the best we can in terms of policies, bold kinds of interventions uh, to really get us on track. Uh, where the trend is good in some ways, but we're so far from the speed needed to, to really replace fossil fuels with fully renewable systems. Who signed the treaty so far? Um, well, uh, Mark, you might want to chip in here too. That, just to be clear, the treaty, this is an idea of a treaty that ought to be like with nuclear weapons, all countries, all states ought to come together and really negotiate this and decide that let's close down this 
uh, threat to humanity uh, uh, and do that through multilateralism, of course, uh, with these components. Uh, what we're at right now, of course, is a call for states to do that. Uh, there's no formal negotiations yet. So the idea now is to get the momentum politically from all kinds of actors to call for this so that countries actually start to move towards real negotiations. Of course, this is also a way to really spotlight not least the production side of the problem, which has been neglected. It's been a lot of focus on emissions. And I think Mark can speak more to the, the kind of beauty of also focusing in on the production side through this framework. So uh, there's a lot of people signing on, including big, big cities like Vancouver, uh, Barcelona, uh, Los Angeles, and many others coming along Canberra just recently. Uh, but that's basically signing on to the call for the idea. Uh, of course, in the end of the day, it would be states that negotiate such a, a treaty. But Mark, you might have more to say. But you're yeah, that's, that's right. Thanks, Nicholas. So, so far, the treaty has been supported by Los Angeles, Vancouver, a few other cities around the world. Um, but I, I just want to sort of track back a little bit because, Paul, you asked the question, uh, what was the genesis or the origins uh, of this? And some some people on the call may may know my nonprofit group, which is Carbon Tracker, which um, probably best known for the, sort of the phrases "stranded assets" and "unburnable carbon" around our analysis of um, looking at fossil fuel reserves of publicly traded companies like Exxon and and Shell and BP. So we knew, as Nicholas has said, we knew there's far more fossil fuels out there we can possibly burn to stay below 1.5 degrees. But we needed to look at the business plans of every fossil fuel major and to confirm this, which is which is what we've done. But I, I had one of those strange years where I was doing a lot of traveling. I, I, I hate to confess that I have done a lot of travel and we have offset it as much as we can. But um, so I, I have to make apologies for doing all this international travel. But I was in Norway at a conference and I was speaking on a panel and and. Um, just before I spoke, the Prime Minister of Norway spoke and said, we, we are a very responsible country, we support the Paris Agreement, but at the same time, we must responsibly develop all of our fossil fuels, which is why we're going up into the Arctic. And I thought, that's a rather extraordinary, contradictory position. And then I went to Canada, and I was speaking at the GLOBE conference in Vancouver, and Trudeau, the, the, the President, Prime Minister, whatever he is, was speaking, and he said the same thing. He said, we're a very responsible country, uh, we support the Paris Agreement, uh, but we must responsibly develop all of our oil sands in Alberta as responsibly as we can. Um, and then I had to go down to Argentina to debate with the Central Bank of Argentina. Uh, and they said the same thing. We're Argentina, a very responsible country. We must responsibly develop all of our oil and gas. And I, I went back to London. And I thought, all these people supporting the Paris Agreement, all of them want to develop all their fossil fuels. This is, this is insane. This is, has to be the definition of insanity if, if we have to go that far. Because all of you cannot support the Paris Agreement, which um, calls for us to keep the world to well below two degrees, whilst every country, every corporation plays a game of beggar thy neighbor. Uh, my barrel of oil will be the last barrel to be produced. It's that country or that company that will have to keep it in the ground. And there you've got the inherent contradiction between climate policy. Now, what's, why, why do we have this? And it's a, it's a very simple reason. As Nic Nicholas says, the Paris Agreement is about emissions reductions. Each country commits to reduce emissions, doesn't commit to constrain the supply of fossil fuels. And in fact, many, many countries who support the Paris Agreement, on one side, they, they're calling for emissions reductions. And in the same office, you've got people handing out new oil and gas exploration licenses and new coal permits. Um, and the Paris Agreement doesn't mention fossil fuels anywhere, anywhere in it. And that's its inherent flaw. So, so um, a number of us support Burnley chairs the treaty, myself, uh, a, a fantastic team have come together behind the treaty, go on to fossilfueltreaty.org's website uh, to decide, well, what are we going to do about this? And, and as Nicholas said, what we need is a uh, a planned international negotiation where companies come to the table and governments come to the table and agree to lay it all out on the, uh, on the same table and like we did with nuclear weapons and agree to give up our licenses and give up our, our permits. 
So how do we do that? And that's the, the last bit I want to talk about, Paul, if I may. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to build a global registry of who is planning what, where, and when. It's called the Global Registry of Fossil Fuel Production. Now, it may surprise people that no such publicly available record exists. So if you're part of the climate negotiating team, I don't know if any, pick a country at random, when you go to the conference of the parties, the COP, with climate negotiators, you can't refer to a, a global map of fossil fuels and say, look, this is what's happening here. So that's why civil society groups funded by philanthropy so far have come together um, and uh, to support the global register. I, ch I chair that part of the project. Uh, and we're building out the maps of every project, tens of thousands of projects of oil and gas and coal around the world. And we hope to launch it at the COP. Now, why is it different from what you can get from Woodmac or the IEA or BP uh, or Reistad is what we're looking at is cumulative carbon dioxide. We're looking at how much carbon dioxide is in the reserves owned by Chevron and Exxon, each of whom we know is spending $20 billion a year on adding even more reserves to what we can't burn. And with that CO2 map, we can create a clicking, a, a ticking clock that each project gets approved, each project that goes into production, all the tens of billions and trillions of dollars going into expanding fossil fuel production, uh, we can look at it and we can, we can have a sanity test. Well, civil society and the scientists can have a sanity test, that the bankers and the politicians, they can have that insanity test. Uh, and the rest of us, we can get into the detail and have what I hope will be a, a, a grown up and informed discussion about the challenges of what we really need to do of keeping fossil fuels on the ground. And this idea that, which we hear from Shell, that uh, we can only go as fast as society moves. That's his argument for producing more fossil fuels. Um, and that's, that's what's called the drug dealer's excuse. Well, of course, we're only selling these, these oil because our customers demand it. Well, of course, of course, we, of course that, that's uh, why people produce. That's the same reason why drug dealers peddle drugs. Doesn't mean we should do it. Um, and what I have, and this is my last comment, is what all of us should have, everyone in working on the treaty should have what I call a, a no regrets policy. We don't, we don't go above one and a half degrees, which we've not seen for, for millions of years, that level of warming. We don't do that just on a whim, just because a few countries, rich countries, let's be frank, say they need the fossil fuels to keep their lifestyle and their standards of living. It's a tough choice, but I think the no regrets approach is the right approach. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, of course. And so this concept of stranded assets, um, you know, reserves are on the balance sheet, equipment is on the balance sheet. Oh, yeah. Um, and then you have this capital expenditure. And when um, early on in the days of HIP, we wrote a multi five page story for Fast Company to say, this is in 2007, what percentage of capital expenditure is not fossil fuel? And at most, it was uh, mid single digits. And for most, it was low single digit percentages. Um, so this 100 billion, 125 billion in the US and 400 billion globally of CapEx, those are just the public companies. There's about 384 yeah. public companies globally. Uh, in the That was 2007, Paul. I mean, these low mid single digit numbers hasn't really moved that much. And here we are in 2021. Not. It is not. It's still single digits, if that. But you wouldn't know that from all the adverts on, on the newspapers and the underground with, you know, Exxon with all its sort of algae and BP with its wind turbines. You know. Yeah, we should force all Exxon executives to drive algae-based cars. So, um, um, But kind of there's not only that, I think the power of the non-proliferation treaty that you're describing, Mark and Nicholas, is also um, there's a uh, you know, the country of Russia, that there's a fair amount of reserves that are uh, country owned and different sure. countries around the world. Own sure. Reserves. I mean, the same arguments applied with uh, nuclear weapons. The Russians said, we're not giving up ours if the Americans won't. And then you had the Chinese and the French and the British. Um, that's why civil society came in. Those of us, you know, you'll know the history of the, the, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. What it started with was it started with NGOs, civil society scientists saying, well, let us count. And countries saying, okay, you, can, you can't tell us what to do, but you can come and count it. Um, once they counted it, which took a little bit of time, they had the round table discussions where the countries put it out all on the table and America said, well, we've got 7,000 
and the Russians said, well, we've got 7,000. Um, and then you had this idea of, you know, well, this is a ridiculous game of proliferation. Um, and I suspect, I hope, I sincerely hope that with the 400 organizations have endorsed um, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty um, and all the political working groups, all the cities and all the groups like the OECD, the IEA that we've been talking to, uh, that we can build a situation where it becomes the, just the logical next step, this no regrets next step, where we can start to de-escalate. Right, so everybody on this call can go and get their organization uh, or others to endorse it as well. And you can sign it as an individual. I've signed it myself. You can Just sign so it as an individual. You can sign it as an organization. If you're a Nobel exactly. laureate, you can sign it. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, if, yeah, if anyone here stuff. is from the French government or the Dutch, can they please sign it too? <laughs> well, they're already committed to sustainable development goals. So um, hopefully that won't be too far behind. Just to maybe chip in there also, I think, you know, what is really powerful with this uh, is that it's not just a top line kind of narrative and argument which is proven itself already it's so effective um, but it's there's quite a lot of detail and, and and principles and kinds of ideas for approaches in this although it's a very kind of open-ended process as well which is fabulous to see and be part of and lots of people coming in with ideas and helping shape it so it's really a collective kind of really a movement in a way, uh, but with many different kinds of stakeholders, which of course also shows the sort of potential and promise to, to it in, a, in say building the political momentum that is of course ultimately needed to, to get states to sit down and do the negotiations. Um, of course, a moral imperative and the sort of the, the, the sanity kind of aspect of this, you know, we gotta do this, it's, it's clear. Otherwise we're, we're basically, you know, committing suicide. Uh, as a as a civilization, and 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 that's of course in our hands. But I think um, one of the key things that are already very well developed is, as I, I just alluded to in the first uh, remark, the the recognition of equity as a kind of and 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 fairness as a as really at the core of of the whole thing. Those all these three pillars I mentioned in the beginning too. It's got to be kind of you know some kind of recognition of um, what are the different contexts here and, 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 and who can do what under what circumstances. So it's not just kind of making, you know, all, all fossil fuels are evil and, and anybody's dealing with them, you know, got to be smashed. It's, it's, it's to go beyond that and say, look, we're in this and we need to really, really quickly move from one system to a completely new system. And incidentally, too, it's not just replacing the fuels, right? There are some promises here, too, in a renewable energy society that is, is diverse, where you have huge kinds of different kinds of ownership. You, you can have uh, many, many small entities. This is distributed energy. You can actually harness it wherever you are, wind, solar, small hydro. You, know, you can have a zillion entities producing and consuming energy. And that, of course, opens up for a very different economy to much more participatory, much more meaningful, much more sort of truly development oriented. And, and of course, that is a whole package of things we're very excited about too. But on the phase out, um, just to say, you know, it's, it's quite clear here that everybody's got to stop expanding and everybody's got to stop producing. But um, how do we kind of look to the equity dimension of this? And, and it's quite clear that, of course, a country like Norway, you mentioned already, US, uh, uh, Canada, these countries, they don't really depend much on oil revenues for their, their state budgets and, and they're wealthy, right? So they, they gotta be first to stop, they can stop today. And they also have money to actually provide support for other countries that you know are on the other end of the spectrum that are poor, have a, a huge dependency on, on fossil fuels for their uh, social expenditures and need more time and, and, and you know, not just money support, but we need to kind of collectively build a narrative of a different kind of development model that is much more diversified and, and people oriented and sustainable. So we have this kind of spectrum that needs to be factored into, you know, what eventually would be uh, negotiations. Gulf states might not need support, but maybe it's a bit more time because they're so trapped in the in, in this right. economy. But in Saudi Arabia, much. they're actually already have developed, uh, have a development plan so, for a post oil. Exactly. Plan. And they know, they know what's coming. So, so yeah. Yeah. So Danielle, uh, maybe you can join us because you've been leading a lot of company specific initiatives. It'd be great to hear 
the tangible actions that you and the As You So team have pressed forward. And so Mark and Nicholas are working sort of top down with uh, to get governments organized, but you're working bottom up to get um, shareholders organized and to help uh, motivate some change. Can you tell us more about the actions you're taking? Sure. Um, and I, I can just start with saying what As You So is. We're a nonprofit group and we represent investors in engaging on with companies on climate change. So we work with a whole range of investors. And one of the things that we do is we engage directly with companies on behalf of investors. So one way um, shareholders and investors can loan us their shares and we use them to make change at the company level. Um, another thing that we work with investors on especially Main Street investors, is, is voting your shares. So when there are important proposals that come uh, that are on the proxies each year, voting for those is incredibly important. So if you, if you can see my slides, can you see my slides right now? Yes. Great. So I will just quickly run through some of the work that we're doing, just so you're familiar with the time, some of the engagements and uh, resolutions that are being brought at the company level. So one is a new, a new engagement called Say on Climate. And what it's saying is that every single company should have a net zero by 2050 target, a transition plan with interim targets to hit net zero by 2050, and an actual plan that they share with investors to say, this is how we're going to achieve it. This is how we're going to invest our money to get there. We also worked with banks over the last three years and we got six of the largest U.S. banks to agree to measure, disclose, and set net zero targets for their financed emissions. And what that meant is that banks not only, they have to recognize that they have responsibility. Every dollar that they invest in a fossil fuel company is, is part of their responsibility. And so we have asked them to reduce their financed emissions, set goals, set interim targets, and start making the hard decisions necessary to get to that net zero target. Um, we've been working with utilities for over a decade, moving them toward away from fossil fuels, toward renewables, energy efficiency, and electrification. So um, many utilities have moved from coal to natural gas, which is good. And now it's time to move from natural gas to electrification and other renewables. So that's important. And then we find that um, many of the oil and gas companies seeing the writing on the wall eventually are, are pitching the fact that we need to dig out more fossil fuels for petrochem because um, there's going to be an enormous demand for single use plastics as companies develop and other petrochem uh, products. So we're working with, with, we're working to demonstrate one that there is an enormous global movement to to reduce use of plastic. And so that's not likely going to save these companies and certainly is not going to be an excuse to keep um, finding new reserves and developing them. And we've brought some interesting proposals this year and got some great votes. And then methane, of course, is always part of the, uh, we started with fracking and have moved on with the oil and gas companies, but controlling methane is critical. And I'll just say, folks um, who don't know about the CA 100 pen, plus benchmark. This is important because over 575 uh, investors, asset owners, asset managers came together and they have 50, over 54 trillion in assets. And they, what they said is, we are going to tell companies what the bottom line is on climate for us. So we, this is what we need to hear from. This is what companies need to report to us. And this is what companies need to do. And so there are 10 indicators starting with net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. And note that that does says offsets and other means are only a last resort. They're not, you can't rely on offsets, which we've seen from a lot of oil and gas companies. You've got to have long-term, medium, and short-term targets. So not just putting off reckoning until 2050, but on the road to getting there, starting at 2021 20, to 25. Decarbonization strategy. Are you going to actually achieve those targets and ensuring that capital investments are aligned with net zero if you're putting money into new fossil fuel plants projects pipelines 
that, then you're likely heading in the wrong direction. And as, a note, as was noted before, disclosure of those things is important because that's how we assess where companies are going. And then it's not okay for companies to say, yes, we have a net zero target, we have a plan, but we're going to lobby or our trade groups are going to lobby against rational climate laws and rules and regulations. Similarly, you've got to have climate governance on your board and your executive compensation should be aligned directly with achieving your targets, just transition and then TCFD. And over to the side here, I, I note that General Electric we had a 98% vote in support of the first five indicators this year. The company actually agreed with us and they did not oppose, which was striking and new. And therefore we got a 98% vote. Um, Caterpillar, we asked them to comply with the first five indicators, the targets, the decarbonization strategy, and we got a 48% vote. So shareholders are getting behind a movement by companies in this way. And so asset managers and others can look at these benchmarks and ask if their companies are meeting them. And then utilities, uh, we've done, as I said, utilities work, petrochemical work, DuPont, 81.2% vote in support. That was the highest ever environmental vote were, uh, um, on this. And the company actually opposed it. And we asked them to account for their plastic pellet pollution. And so getting a handle on uh, plastic pollution in the oceans and, and the plastic pollution pellets are also an excuse for developing more oil and gas, as I said earlier. Banks, um, six of the biggest banks down here you'll see set net zero targets. Now they're on to the difficult work of measuring their finance emissions, disclosing that, and then setting those interim targets and hitting them. And then not only once, once they do that, we also have to get them to, I mean, so you can set targets and everybody knows targets are targets, but until you start meeting them, until you stop funding the projects that are contributing to climate change, you, you're not on the road to net zero. So looking at, at what is being financed is key. And we'll continue to do that. And then I um, have this alliances of alliances, just to note that there is a lot of work in the financial arena aligning with net zero. And so there's more than 70 trillion that have joined the net zero banking alliance, net zero asset owner alliance, Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance. There may also be a Net Zero Insurance Alliance. But um, if you're one of these parties, you can join these and then get to the serious work of actually making progress um, in that direction. And I, I do think it's important that we're starting to see the entire financial services sector recognize the need for change. Now we've got to actually move them in the right direction and stop the funding of fossil fuels. And then last, I'll talk briefly about a tool we have, which um, in order to invest your values and reduce fossil fuels in your investments, you need to know what you own. And so if you hold mutual funds, we've created a tool. We've got two tools here, fossil free funds, deforestation free funds. And what those do is they allow you to see what's in your portfolio. So you can go to fossilfreefunds.org, type in, Vanguard, Fidelity, um, or the name of a specific fund, and then you will see um, information about what is in that fund. And we rate them from A to F, and you can see what producers, is it coal that's giving you a grade of, in this case, a grade of a D, is it um, coal, oil and gas, pipelines, etc. And so this is a good tool to help you understand, to know what you own, and then also allows you to, if you go up the top here, you can see the Clean 200, you can get um, companies that have higher scores, and so you can uh, actually figure out how to move your investments in the right direction. So I'll stop there and um, I'll take questions later. Okay, yeah, so lots of action. It's so exciting that you and your team can lead this at As You So, Danielle. Mark and Nicholas, um, there's 160 financial firms signed up for this. So are any, is there any crossover yet with the non-proliferation treaty with these net zero alliances? How much of this can sort of build on each other? 
Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So Carmen Tracker, we are very pleased to support the work of As You Sow. We're also part of Climate Action 100. We provide the data on oil and gas and power and utilities that's used for investor engagement. And what we do is we analyze the capital expenditure programs of every major uh, power and utility company and oil and gas company and test those against the goals of the Paris Agreement. Now, actually, the world's got a lot easier now that the International Energy Agency has come out with their net zero plan that says that to achieve 1.5 degrees, there should be no new investment in, in increasing capacity anywhere in the world for coal, oil or gas. Uh, so that rather sets a marker to look at what these companies are doing. So let's turn back to the CA100. What that actually means is that if the world is serious, all these net zero investor alliances, uh, the real question is, do they back the International Energy Agency's 1.5 degree scenario? And if they do, all investor engagement should be focused on stopping new investment in new production. Let's be clear about that. That's what the significance of this announcement is. Now, what we have is, in, is investors saying, dull up the renewables, change some board directors, which I absolutely support. But what we really need is board level commitments to say no new expansion. And I think, and I don't think I'm in any disagreement with Danielle um, in saying, look, if boards are not up for this and the management as a consequence of companies are not up for what this challenge is, what we've got to do uh, is remove board directors. And that's exactly what's happened with Engine One with their proxy battle over Exxon. Um, and that's the next phase of the game. Uh, the game. Well, it's more than a game. That's the next phase of where this battle takes us. It's uh, it's got to come from the board down, and I absolutely support the work that, uh, as you so and Danielle's team and Andy and their colleagues have been doing in, in quite rightly challenging the management of the world's largest fossil fuel companies to to really sort of say, are, are you up for the for what we need to do in the next ten years? Great, bottle, you're here. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, second everything that's been said, uh, but I also would like to frame it in a, a bit more aggressively, given the urgency. Um, so thanks to the work that, as you saw, and Carbon Tracker and all the data available to us and understanding what it means to have CapEx at hundreds of billions of dollars being added as we speak every year. To me, every document approving the CapEx expenditure by board directors, executives, bankers, is, means one of two things. It's either a collective suicide pact, understanding that this is not going to generate a, a livable planet, or it's a, a, an explicit agreement with full understanding that they're robbing their shareholders, investors, by creating stranded assets and stuffing their portfolios, uh, pension funds, endowments for universities, uh, retirement funds, you name it, with assets that will blow up in their faces, which means endowment managers, pension fund managers, everybody else, including pensioners themselves, to do your due diligence and look at these assets and say, yes, we're gonna buy more is, is, is not what the law says, right? So this is, we're talking about criminal activity, either way you look at it. It's either a robbery in, in plain sight or it's a collective suicide pact. And I think, you know, one of the things that we need to be doing, and I think the, the fossil fuels uh, initiative, non-proliferation treaty initiative is helping us build the momentum in this direction, which is, Number one, apply pressure on, on diplomats and government agencies, but also on, um, on, on the financial industry, because they're, they're finally waking up to the reality that this is actually building up explosive assets on their balance sheets. Now, also working with investors and everyday citizens whose retirements are you know, embedded into, into those funds and building the pressure on states to actually sit down and negotiate these, uh, this, this treaty um, and, and agree to actual non-proliferation, meaning all the CapEx investments that we're seeing is, should, should stop immediately. We're already falling behind based on you know, all the uh, estimates and, and goals. And then the, the last point I wanna say, which has to do with the global South, the, this, the divide that we have between the global North and the global South, and this is slightly different than the nuclear non-proliferation situation because the number of jobs 
that will be lost in the global south. The platform for economic development that the global south has been using and plans to continue using. Um, and it, all of that needs to change. So the, the concept of a just transition for the global south is extremely important. So we have to rethink the model of economic development in the global south. I'll give you two basic data points. Uh, today, if you net out all global transactions between global north and global south, $2 trillion a year net are moving from the global south, the poorest countries to the richest countries. So we're not going to be able to do this unless we reverse the global flow of financial of the global financial architecture. So that's point number one. Point number two, the global north has the financial resources, has the technology and is responsible. We have the numbers. We know it from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is responsible for climate debt. So we're talking about climate reparations in the form of direct transfer of financial resources to restructure the economies of the global south, help decarbonize and accelerate your transition, transfer of technology and, and know-how as rapidly as possible. So this has to be part of the conversation. Relying simply on uh, cap and trade and carbon tax. If we started this in the 70s, maybe, but not at this point and not with the level of negative flows of finances from the global south to the global north. So we're talking about massive restructuring of the global economy for serious uh, about this. And this is kind of the, the work that um, my colleagues and I at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity has, have been doing, uh, especially with small developing countries who, are try who, are, who know that the problem is there, but they have no pathway for a, an alternative model of economic development, especially on the financing of it because everything on the table is you're gonna finance it, you either tax or you, um, or, or you ask for more foreign aid, which is yeah. drops in the bucket uh, or, or nothing, right? Yeah. You just continue doing what you're mm -hmm. doing. So we can't just shove this problem under the rug. It has to be part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I was gonna make one point just about availability of capital. You know, you're, you're clearly absolutely right. There is a huge amount of capital washing around the world, despite mounting debts. Interest rates are close to zero. Cost of equity in many countries has declined significantly. We have more capital than we know what to do with because the next revolution that's unfolding, the robot revolution, doesn't need much capital investment. So that money can be invested in long-term projects. And a lot of this must head towards the global South as well as what's needed in the West. I know we're very close to end of time, but I'd love to ask one question, which is you know, in the, the natural world, we talk about tipping points. So the work from the Stockholm Resilience Center, et cetera. I'm also very interested in what are the tipping points, whether it is in you know, investment, and we've also talked about, is there a fast approaching tipping point in directors' liabilities where the whole weight of decision-making will be forced to change because you have enough of this going in one direction that it's too dangerous to be left, on, be left, to be left behind. So I'm not sure if anyone's got a view on that, but I'm, I'm very interested in this point as a lever that may drive significant change. I would say at the company level, we are seeing those tipping points. So with the banks, when one bank announced a net zero goal, then you started to see more falling in line. And I think that is more companies. Um, I, so I, I think at least at the micro level, we are starting to see that. And we'll see how that translates out. But that doesn't mean that we're seeing the significant changes that we need in the structure of the financial system. So um, BP uh, executive, chief executive Bernard Looney was the first chief exec to do two things. First, agree that there's such a thing as the science of carbon budgets. How much CO2 can we limit in the atmosphere? He then followed it by saying that therefore BP must cut production by 40%, uh, excluding their partnership with, 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 uh, with, with, with Rosneft in, in Russia. But the principle was there, um, a chief exec of a major oil and gas company mm. accepting that we need to cut production. That could be a tipping point, and it just needs other companies to essentially agree and say the same thing. Yeah, it's very interesting. Fadal, have you got anything you want to add to that, or, or Nicholas? Uh, Nicholas, go ahead, please. 
Well, I just wanted to echo also what you said, Fedor. I completely agree. And I think that is the, the most important kind of perspective to take that global piece of a global just transition. We need to see that as, as a, the whole, right? And, and, and those money flows, uh, as, as we mentioned, are, are, are really incredible. Uh, I think also what we need to understand here is that um, the, I added a few links. Uh, there's a lot of talk about net zero by 2050. I think there's, we need to scrutinize that very, very carefully because the, 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 what we need to do is so much more and so much faster. The, the, the treaty initiative just launched a report. I, I sent you a link or put a link in the chat of a, 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 an exit strategy. It really shows how we can go to 100% renewables in the next decade to the, the largest extent. And then of course it tapers off a bit. So by 2050, of course, we need to be 100% renewables, but the most of the change needs to happen now. And it needs to happen also in the global South. Mm -hmm. And it's, as you said, Fadel, that needs to be done as a collective exercise where we all support what needs to be done in, in, in less rich countries. And it, you talked about climate debt, et cetera. That is fundamental. And it's really part and parcel of this treaty as well. And that's why you need a global kind of multilateral process because it will never happen by itself by individual actors. That's where you need to have principles of equi equity at the core. And you also have to see through the sort of scams around these commitments to net zero by mm. 2050 when you know the reality is many of these are evasion and, and, and smoke screens and, and sort of just, you know, there's a lot of good, good, good things, but it's also uh, not enough if, if you don't really look to what needs to be done. And then I think the bottom line is, yes, there's a good trend when it comes to renewables, but um, you know the beauty of the treaty is that we're hitting hard on the fossil fuel producers again, right? That's that's really innovative and super important, and that in tandem with the third pillar of the treaty, which is recognizing just transition, economic diversification, as Fadel said, and also the the incredible challenge but possibility of creating the policies, the guarantees, the sort of global Marshall Plan schemes that we need to do to get the the, the vast accelerated ramp up of renewables investments to happen and to make that also not create new problems. So I think that's my last point. We fight in the fossil industry. The next battlefront will be what kind of renewable energy system are we getting? Are we getting one with this corporate domination, land grabs, human rights abuses, the same old story, but renewables kind of framed? Or are we getting to a system where we're we actually getting prosperity and well-being for people also in the global south, but also in our rich countries, that is renewably powered? And that's, of course, the new development model you talked about, where renewable energy systems also, again, are luckily, coincidentally prone to be more democratized and better. You know, mm -hmm. they're distributed by nature. We don't need huge concentration in terms of major corporations, huge utilities, and militarized kinds of system. We can actually build a new society that is green, zero emissions, and people friendly. So, but that's not a given. That's that's for us all to frame at this very moment and get the right uh, sort of trajectory in place. Adel, you want the last word? Well, uh, I'll just add one. Uh, I completely agree, Nicholas uh, and, and Mark. I'll just add one thing to highlight the importance of this, um, the need for alternative model for economic development. Most of the global south has a massive amount of external debt, and the pandemic is just reminding everybody of, of what that means. We're actually, there, there's a, a debt crisis unfolding as we speak now for the global south. If you look at the sources of the, of the external debt, it's usually three sources. One is lack of food security. Number two, it's lack of energy security. And number three, it's a mismatch between the value added content of what developing countries export versus what they import. They usually export low value added content and import high value added content. So one third, roughly speaking, I'm eyeballing the numbers, one third of the problem has to do with energy security because they import fossil fuels. And this is true even for developing countries who are actually exporters of fossil fuel. Why? Because they export the crude oil, which is useless, and they import the higher value added content, gasoline and kerosene and petrochemicals to run their economy. So even the ones that are so quote unquote blessed with lots of oil and gas are actually trapped in a deficient economic development model. So if you recognize the need to get out of this debt trap requires investing in energy security, renewable energy security, investing in food security. Today, Africa imports 85% of its food and it's the most fertile land on the planet. 
right? So we have to recognize that these are not things that happen by accident. There is a system in place, a global international trade and finance system that makes it so. So we have to undo these forces. And it just so happens that undoing it requires massive investment in renewables, massive investment in sustainable agriculture and the places that need it the most. So I'll leave it at that. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Nicholas and Mark and Danielle and Fidel. It's been a fascinating and eye-opening discussion and a host of useful links and comments posted in the chat. So we will collect those and put those on the website for everybody who wants to come back to them later on. Uh, I think, you know, just to add one thing to what Nicholas said about the democratization of energy, we've seen this on the east coast of Australia, a large power station, Calide C, one of the units blew up about six weeks ago and took, uh, it's, you know, it's, I think it's one 660 megawatt unit, so very modest in the context of the 15 million people on the East Coast, but it's dramatically disrupted power across the entire country. For a month, there's been crazy power prices, up to $15,000, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, must be a megawatt hour uh, for periods of the day. And the solution and to that, of course, is to rely much less on a small number of large fossil fuel powered power stations that turn out to be thoroughly unreliable when it comes to baseload energy. That's a little ironic, and hopefully this is a little bit of a coming to Jesus moment. Anyway, looking forward to next week, we are going to turn to the subject of Black Wall Street, something which I, living in the US, knew nothing about. Many people living in the US hear nothing about, and really shocking tale of I don't really know how to put it into words, but really shocking impact on the black community 100 years ago today, or almost today. And we're going to look with Dr. Oliver Spencer, Dr. Dolores Henderson and Ron Homer, three people who are closely connected with those communities about what are the real life issues that are being faced today? What, do, you know, what can we do to try to drive change beyond simply sitting by and saying, this is a terrible thing and we should do more. How can we act? So with that, thank you all very much for joining us this week. And we look forward to, to seeing you again next week as we turn to Black Wall Street. Thank you all. <laughs>